There was some uh, ideal returning from the land of the for that. So this was part of the uh, initial side. No. Namaskar and good morning to all of you. Today is the uh, last date of this uh, six-day uh, festival of letters. And uh, in the previous years, uh, before last year, we have started this uh, particular segment, the festival of letters on translation. So we were succeeded in last two years and this is the third year in that sequence. And I hope this year too we will have a good deliberations and we will have something new dimensions to this topic particularly. I request uh, the dignitaries taking part in the inaugural session to come on the dais. Uh, Professor Sitan Shashish Chandraji, eminent Gujarati writer who will deliver the inaugural address. I request him to come on the dais. And also Professor Sumanya Satpatiji who will deliver the keynote address with an eminent English scholar. I request him to come on the dais. President Sahit Academy, Professor Vishnath Sattivariji. And also Vice President Sahit Academy, Professor Chandrasekhar Kambarji. I request all of them to come on the dais. request President Sahit Academy to welcome the chief guest of this morning with a, a packet of bookets, books. Yeah, also to the keynote address. Professor Sitan Shishishandarji, eminent Gujarati writer and also convener of our Sahit Academy's Gujarati Advisory Board, respected President Sahit Academy, Dr. Vishnath Prasad Tiwariji, Dr. Sumanya Satpatiji, eminent English scholar, respected Vice President Sahit Academy, Dr. Chandrasekhar Kambarji, all the translators and scholars who are assembled here and friends. I am glad to welcome all of you for this edition of Seminar on Translation. Translation lies at the core of all of Sahit Academy's activities. It is through translation that the Academy carries best of literature from one language region to other languages and regions of the country. Academy carries best of one literature from language or region to other languages and regions through publications and literary events, including translation workshops. Majority of Sahit Academy publications are translations in all the 24 Indian languages recognized by it. But why should Sahit Academy focus on translation or, for that matter, carry literature from one region language to other regions and languages? The answer for that question lies in the mandate provided to Sahit Academy at the time of founding. When founded in 1954, the founding fathers of Sahit Academy provided a very clear mandate that the work of Sahit Academy shall be to connect and unite varied country, so varied literary, linguistic and cultural traditions of the country. This they envision shall be Sahit Academy's contributions towards national integration and nation development. And the Academy has been abiding by the mandate of mandate for close to 63 years now by carrying the literature from one language, region, language to other regions, languages, cultures, through translations, thereby enhancing the awareness and understanding of other cultures, languages and literatures. This is the prime reason Sahit Academy has been publishing large number of translations, organizing translation workshops, and seminars, symposia, and translation. As I mentioned a few years back, we have introduced this uh, particular segment to be a part of our annual festival of letters, and I hope 
This will continue for more and more years to come. Today's topic, translation as retelling, is a very fascinating one. Translation as retelling has been in vogue for a very long time in our country and in all the regions, languages and cultures. In my mother tongue, the word Anuadam as a retelling has been in existence for the past 1000 years or so. It is true of all the regions, languages of the country. This tradition of Anuad as retelling lends dynamism and vibrancy to literature. Much of the so-called translations of ancient works of the country were in reality retelling of the epic or a story. This enables the text in question to reach common man in all the regions with ease, with the end of local flavor and native ingredients, without tampering with the core of the original. This freedom was unfound at those times in other parts of the globe. We have divided the seminar into two segments, translation as retelling for the movement to address translation as retelling in the medieval period and translation traditions in Indian literary tra traditions, oral and written. I hope all the participants and audience get benefited from this seminar like last two years. Friends, I take this opportunity in welcoming Professor Sitan Shreshish Chandraji, eminent Gujarati writer and translator who has kindly agreed to deliver the inaugural address and he has around 20 published books to his credit in different genres like poetry collections, plays, literary criticism, etc. And his works have been translated into various Indian languages and he served as a visiting professor at the Sorbonne University, Loyola Marymount University and Jadapur University and he had been the chief editor of Encyclopedia of Indian Literature published by Sahith Academy. He also served as Vice Chancellor of Saurashtra University and is the, uh, is the recipient of Padma Sri by Government of India, Fulbright Scholarship, Ford West European Fellowship, Sahith Academy Award, Ranjit Ram Suvarna Chandra, the highest award in Gujarati Literature, Kabir Samman, Gujarat State Government Poetry Award, etc. Welcome to Professor Sitan Shishishchandra. I warmly welcome Professor Sumanyu Sakpati ji, he is a well-known scholar in English and served as a professor of English, University of Delhi and he has a numerous in, uh, Indian and international publications including original and translated material and research articles and books in English and Odia to his credit and his main area of interest is modernism, peer studies, post-colonial studies and translation and his interest in modernism later resulted in the conceptualization of M. Phil Coors, Sexual Decisions and Modernism, Oscar Wilde and After. Also as an edited volume entitled The Reception of Modernist Poetry in the Times Literary Supplement to 1912-1931 to his credit. And he lectured extensively at different universities and institutions in India and abroad. And he has received several awards and honors like UGC Fellowship, Sastri Indo-Canadian Fellowship, British Council Visitor, Distinguished Fellow, at the Center for Advanced Studies, La Trobe University, and Indian Institute of Advanced Study Fellow, etc. Welcome to Professor Sumanyu Sakpati ji. I sincerely welcome Professor Vishnath Prasad Tiwari ji, President Sahit Academy, who is an eminent poet, critic in Hindi, and Vice President Professor Chandrasekhar Kambar ji, who is an eminent poet, playwright, novelist, essayist in Canada. The chair process of uh, next two sessions, Ms. Uh, Mani, Mani Krishnan and Dr. Blanka Notkova and the scholar participants Dr. Chandrakant Patilji and Dr. J.L. Reddyji, Dr. Uh, Professor Rana Nair and Dr. Ram Shankar Divediji and two more scholars who are, we are expecting that is uh, Dr. Rakshanda Jalil and Nand Kishore Pandey. And thank you and I am glad to welcome all of you once again. Thank you. Now I request Professor Sitan Shuji to deliver the kin. Welcome, sir. In other letters.
प्रोफेसर विश्वनाथ प्रसाद तिवारी जी प्रोफेसर चंद्रशेखर कंबार जी प्रोफेसर सुमन्यू सतपति जी डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास राव जी एमिनेंट ऑथर्स ट्रांसलेटर्स लवर्स ऑफ लिटरेचर हु आर गैदर्ड हेयर टुडे I am glad and grateful to the academy for inviting me to inaugurate this national seminar. It seems however that the seminar has already been inaugurated not by any person but through the agency of an interesting bilingual activity of naming this seminar. this the announcements about this seminar tell us and retell us that it is about translation as retelling it is about anuvad punar kathan ke roop mein the bilinguality of the title has inaugurated an interesting if intriguing process of deliberations on the nature structure and dynamics of translation several questions come up to begin with you could focus on one which of the two titles of this seminar is the original text and which is the translation is anuvad a hindi translation of the english word translation it might seem so but then has the word retell how has the word retelling arrived here it does not seem to come from the word translation however the word punar kathan clearly derives from the word anuvad speaking after is retelling then a translation of anuvad just as punar kathan is derived from anuvad which of these two titles the text and which is the translation many such questions lurk below the surface of this bilinguality of the title this seminar would i trust look up these and many other questions concerning the complex process of telling and retelling but also interrogate the position a translation is in it retelling for it remains to be seen if that is so or whether a translation engages in a process quite different from retelling the structure of these thematic titles reflects the strength and validity of perception and argument that translation is an activity in retelling but it also points out certain areas of weakness and partiality it is a purnata of such perception and such arguments let us first look at the strength and the validity of this position to be open to consider the activity of translation as an activity of retelling or punar kathan is to accept a strikingly indian mode of translation particularly predominant during the second millennium of the common era mainly in what the linguists call modern indian languages <coughs> languages like avadi in which tulsidas retold valmiki's first ramayana in a way indicated in tamil by the poet kamba so this retelling has its own journey 
in Gujarati, in which Narsi Mehta retold in 14th century specific aspects of Vakyas and Mahavakyas told in Sanskrit by the in the Upanishads. And it remains to be seen whether Narsi was a scholar of Sanskrit or whether the Mahavakyas and other elements from the Upanishads and the earlier traditions came to Narsi through oral tradition. But it remains to be seen. We have, don't have full evidence that it came only through oral tradition. And such inquiries, such interrogations are our lot today. <coughs> and Pemanan in the 17th century just retold, like many other poets from other modern languages, stories from Bhagavata Purana, Mahabharata and Ramayana. And it remains to be seen. The inquiry is not just noting this. The inquiry begins at this notation. Because why the choice of these three texts? And which were the other Puranas that were retold? So the choice of the text, the choice of the new language and the choice of the audience. These are the choices which need to be explained over and over again in various ways. To view translation as retelling is to see how the poets and people of India kept their ancient literature and traditional sensibilities alive, not through verbatim translation, but through renderings. This seminar examines different ways in which older texts gain a new span of active life when they are so rendered in newer texts in languages that themselves derive from the classical languages. So translation of classical texts into modern Indian languages is doubly bound. The modern Indian languages themselves derive from the classical tradition, classical language. And the text also come from the classical languages, Sanskrit, also Prakrit, and also Upanishad. Classical languages and Tamil into modern, modern languages. So these pathways are intricate. And uh, one must not be too wedded to an ideological stand let alone political. How does this rejuvenating retell, retelling happen? Akho, a 16th century Gujarati poet, has a remarkably Gujarati way to explain this. Writing about translations from Sanskrit into Gujarati, Akho compares Sanskrit to a coin of higher denomination a rupee and Gujarati to coins of a lower denomination Anna. And then he argues that if you want, if you went to the marketplace where life actually happens and interpersonal transactions take place, you cannot use the costly coin of a rupee like the 2000 rupee note newly issued to us but would require to have <coughs> small change. <coughs> Gujarati, he Akho points out, is a small but useful, indeed necessary change. To render a Sanskrit text, not mechanically or verbatim, but with necessary changes in Gujarati is a necessary step to keep it in circulation, to be organic part of the living body of the contemporary society. Akho has suggested this and he points out that the gold of the big coin needs to be replaced not by small coins in the same gold but in coins in another metal in language, idiom and above all context of life being lived 
by a new contemporary society and individuals. Translation is thus linked closely to historicity of the translator and readers of the translation. When we see the history of literature in all other modern Indian languages, from Kashmiri to Malayalam, Sindhi to Assamese, Manipuri, Bodo, etc., we witness over thousands years of the second millennia how Indian culture, literature, and inner lifestyle of compassion, knowledge, and associative action was kept alive and in circulation by many ways of retelling what was told and by the ancient India of the previous millennium. This seminar is a part of an ongoing study of these life-giving ways of Indian literary practice of Anuvada or Unarkatha. But as I said earlier, the formulations of these bilingual thematic titles, <coughs> translation as retelling Anuvada Unarkatha ke roop mein, reflects not only the strength of and validity of the perception and arguments that go in its making, but also some limitations and mistakes. Let us look at these now. The discourse on translation and indeed the infrastructural discourse on literary cultures that argue in favor of diversity and fluidity are, as the poet Akho has said, necessary for any culture to survive and grow. But if the difference between diversity and fragmentation, between fluidity and dissipation, between Fela and Bikra is not grasped and maintained. A culture could fall apart and eventually cease to exist. Retelling or punarkatan of a text, if it moves from diversity and fluidity to fragmentation and dissipation, could lead that text to fall apart disintegrate and eventually vanish. We could distinguish between two modes of translation as retelling. The mindless mode and the mindful mode. How to distinguish between these two modes? One leading to what could be <coughs> rightly called a textual tradition, the mindful way, leading to a textual tradition. There is a Nursi Mehta tradition, there is a Mirabai tradition, and similarly in other languages. Bhai Mira ke Prabhu Girdar Nagar, even a later poet would write that. Bhane Narsayyo, even a later poet would write, write that. And this is also, in a sense, transmission, translation, retelling by a new poet, but using the old name. So the literary textual tradition could be establish and maintain and nourish if mindfulness is there. But this mindless punar katha seems to be gaining currency in our times. So Akho has not mentioned the third coin which is the counterfeit coin. And now the marketplace is being flooded with these counterfeit coins. We will come to that in a moment. And the other, one could lead to textual tradition, the other could lead to its termination. One leading genealogical continuity of a text, in spite of many changes, or perhaps because of those many changes, and the other leading to its fatal distortion of the text arising out of lack of comprehension 
of the way that text had produced a meaning in the society within which it was first created. Thus, in short, a translator, however innovative and bold, would maintain a continuity with the text he or she translates only if she or he knows how to enter into the textual tradition, which, like a meandering river, could well flow over a vast terrain of centuries and continents. In this context, it would be illuminating to know that the word that has been used for translation in the Indian tradition is not only Anuvada, as Dr. Srinivas Rao said, but perhaps more so, it is Chaya. In Sanskrit drama, as you know, the characters, characters talk to each other in two languages, the king in Sanskrit and the queen in Prakrit. Dushyant in Sanskrit and Shakuntala in Prakrit. And yet they could make perfect love, as you know. This was the interaction. Then the text of the play, so first it would give Prakrit and then the text would, of the play would give the exact translation of the Prakrit part of the dialogue into Sanskrit. Not for the king to follow. He would be a perfect bilingual. But for some other reasons. Perhaps for the viewers and the readers who might know only Sanskrit. You replace Sanskrit with uh, English and you understand what is going on in my argument. I hope that you don't have to replace Sanskrit with Hindi. Though of course there are tendencies uh, in that direction also. But this is what is going on. This is what went on in our culture which survived. Sastra Prakrita Rabbanisha had such fluidity. Vikhalav nahi tha, sahalav tha. Abhi Hindi aisa kar sakegi ya kya? Woh ame sochana chahi. Woh sakat bhi nahi karna chahi. Woh chahala bhi nahi karna chahi. This rendering, this translation was called not anuvad but chaya. Chaya means a shadow. The ontological status of a shadow to the object of which it is a shadow is very interesting and very illuminative for Indian theory of translation. A shadow of a tree could find its location to the west of the tree at the morning or to the east of the tree in the evening. It could be very short at noon and continue to become larger as the sun moves to the western horizon. In short, a shadow has a great amount of freedom. It has only one restriction. It has to be connected to the tree at the place where the tree has struck roots. And this is the relationship between a text and its many translations. No. No translation could enhance the life and the reach of a source text if it loses contact with the location where the source text had struck roots in the ground of its signification. The word chaya has been used not only in Sanskrit text but also in our own times by the great scholar Rahul Sankrityayana in his translation of Baud Dugan or Doha from its original, probably Tibetan or Bhutia language, into Hindi. Lexicographers tell us that the word Anuvada has many meanings. Translation is one of them. Reiteration with corroboration and illustration is another. Anuvada could also mean slender or, or reviling. Again, the word also refers to a passage in the Brahmana text which explain or illustrate a rule or a vidhi previously propounded. There it is called Anuvada Vachana. In short, there are many ways in which Anuvada or retelling could relate 
to the source text ranging from corroboration to slander. And when you read Bauddha and Jayana retelling of Krishna Katha or Ram Katha, you know how within our own tradition something that could be very close to slender also was part of our Anukatha. The Jayana Ramayana, the Jayana Mahabharata, about the Jatak Kathas. They take these characters and they put them in a very different context. One has to wonder to what extent is this useful for a culture? Self-interrogation is one, but masochism is another. It seems that the Jain and Buddhist traditions made us introspect. It was self-interrogation. But something that is going on now in the marketplace, which is all over, as uh, Walter Benjamin would point out for his culture, this marketplace has resulted into very slanderous use, slanderous retelling of ancient texts. If there are protests against that, you must understand those protests also. Not all protests are wrong, but not all protests are right either. So this critical faculty of the author's community is crucial now at this juncture. And that's why the topic that you have selected, sir, is very crucial for our, at this juncture of our culture. What is slanderous rendering of the ancient text? What is self-interrogative rendering of the ancient text? Should we have only two camps that we would stand up with a flag that let anything happen? Or would we stand up with a flag in our hand let nothing happen? These are the two camps in which unfortunately many of us have divided ourselves. Under you, sir, this is a third location, the critical, introspective location. And uh, all this is connected with the seminar today. A sidelight, brilliantly revealing sidelight on how the distance from Vada to Anuvada in this case uh, is uh, naming. In this case, from naming to remaining, could be travel, has, has been shed. This sidelight has been shed in a remarkable interview that the Nigerian novelist Gugi Wal Thiongo gave to our own Harish Trivedi in the year 2003. The novelist had changed the way he wrote his name in his books from James Gugi in his early work to Gugi wa Thiongo, that means Gugi the son of Thiong, in his later works. When Harish asked him about this, Gugi replied saying that his older name as a part of the colonial naming system when Africans were taken as slaves to America and given the name of the plantation owner when a slave was bought, was not acceptable to him. He adds, when a slave was bought by Smith, he was renamed Smith. And Googie, Smith Googie, he points out, and he takes back the original ontological status of that text, namely his name, his real name. He was given that name at birth. He didn't come as a slave. He, he lived in our own times, there was no slavery. He was given that name Smith. But he, he takes an ontological step backwards, which is very important for us. Uh, and he says that Smith was never his real name. He implies through this that though he was neither born nor sold as a slave, that his real name was not his real name. Smith 
was symbolic replacing of identity, one identity with another. That is the reason he gives. So this identity politics also must not fall prey to our subservience to dominant ideologies, either, whether right or left. If someone slaps me with a right hand or with a left hand, I feel the same pain. So, he had replaced his name to Gogi, son of Thiong. Uh, and this uh, dialogue between an Indian and an African is also some relevance uh, to us. It also takes us away from Europe. You can directly talk to you know, others without uh, such dominant uh, culture, either Europe or English language. I hope one day would come when there would be a mach machine which would translate every Gujarati sentence into Malayalam, every Malayalam sentence into Bengali and so on in such a gathering. Mechanical devices are possible. To conclude this talk, it would be useful to visit or for many of us revisit three sites of translation in the Indian tradition. First, the well-known tradition of Brahat Katha, authored by Gonadya in Paishachi Prakrit in around 1st century or 3rd century, between this period, and retold several times in Sanskrit as Brahat Katha Manjari, Brahat Katha Shlok Sangraha, Katha Sarissagar by Somadeva, and so on. Without reiterating details of how it was written and how almost lost, it would be useful in our context to say that Anu Kathana of this text illustrates how in Indic tradition a dominant language like the Pan-Indian Sanskrit provides service and recognition and recognizes the great importance of a text in a marginalized, local and little known language. It opens up a new and now almost but now most pertinent meaning of the prefix anu or re in this age of mindless globalization and merciless high capitalism. A time when the local and the marginal are being wiped off the face of our planet, we must remember that it was Sanskrit with preserved peshachi, with respect, with understanding. The second is an interesting and interest, an instance in the pre-modern medieval Gujarat author telling and retelling his own text. In 1406 uh, of the common era, Jayashekar Suri, Shishya of Mahendra Prabha Suri, a Jain monk in Gujarat, wrote a Sanskrit Rupaka Kavya titled Prabodha Chintamani following rules for writing a Mahakavya in Sanskrit. He then rewrote it in Gujarati as Tribhuvana Deepaka Prabandha, as a Prabandha poem or long narrative poem. The choice made by Jaya Shekhar in 15th century Gujarat assumes much significance for the activity of translation and retelling when the social political context of the text in the context and the style of the text are viewed in a significant relationship. The poem presents a rupaka, a rupaka mala in fact, of a king, his queens and his minister and minister's wives and sons. You can very well see how this is going on. Sons not only of the king, but sons and grandsons of the pradhana also, the minister. So this text resonates with so much and how does he, I'm not talking about the text, I'm talking about the rendering. How does the Gujarati poet do? does this rendering through Rupakamara? The poem presents a Rupaka of a king, queen, ministers, wives, sons, all of them connected to the craft of ruling. To put it very briefly, the poem tells of King Paramahansa represents Jivatma forsaking his queen Chetana and falling for his queen Maya and choosing to live in a city called Kaya Nagari 
Queen Maya then teams up with the minister Mana to imprison the king. The plot then unfolds and tells how Viveka, son of Mana, with one of his wives, Nivrutti, the other being Pravrutti, defeats all others and restores the dethroned king Paramahansa to and in the company of Queen Chetana to the throne of Tribhuvana. So this word Tribhuvana Deepaka Prabandha, this Tribhuvana has been added. It was not there in Sanskrit. And if you look closely at it, you can see how things are moving and how a good translation becomes relevant in situations even later on. Now the qu- So, I would like to con- conclude with a brief reference to another Gujarati author translator, Mahatma Gandhi, and his short and profound book, Hind Swaraj. Gandhi, as you know, wrote it in Gujarati in 1909. He then translated it in, into English. I would focus on a single issue related to Gandhi's own retelling or Anuvada or Punar Kathana of his Gujarati book into English. In Gujarati book, Gandhi wrote of Sudharo and Kudharo, that is reform and bad customs. This had a reference to the long to the long decades of cultural history of Gujarat, starting with the mid-19th century poet Naraman and Dalpatram, and was relevant to the and easily graspable to Gandhiji's Gujarati readers in 1909. Sudaro and Kudaro have been discussed extensively by writers who preceded Gandhi for 50 years. And so this was but he had he has translated these two words very differently in his English retelling. The word Sudaro has been translated as civilization and the bad part of it meaning modern western civilization. And the word Kudaro has been completely dropped. Gandhi's choice of permission has a significance for the art and the science of translation. He dropped the baggage that he considered extra for his uh, bringing his own text to a new context. This omission did not diminish the original text. It made it more active. It allowed it to grow in the new environment. I hope that he would keep in mind all these actualities of telling and retelling that have been ours for not only centuries, but millennia. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful paper. Friends, so much have seen that he is a creative writer and also a practitioner of translation. So his paper is not very academic, very practical and also very creative kind of, not very much theory, but he has mentioned about very creative process he has uh, presented his paper. And thank you so much. And now I request President Sahit Academy uh, to address this August gallery. Adani Sri Sitansu Yesas Chandraji Sumanyu Satpati Ji Chansekhar Kambar Ji K. Srinivas Rao Ji Tatha Samne Bethe Sabhi Adani Sajjanu Sitansu Ji Ne Bhaut Achha परचा हमारे सामने बहुत क्रिएटिव परचा रखा और दिक्कत थोड़ी यह है कि इस समय बहुत कम है मतलब इस समय इस गोष्टी को खत्म हो जाना चाहिए मगर मैराथन दौड़ के कारण बहुत सवारियां बाधित हो गईं तमाम सड़कें बंद हो थीं इसलिए यह गोष्टी देर से शुरू हुई है मैं बहुत संक्षेप में इसलिए कुछ कहूंगा एलपी टेसिटरी ने एक चीज तो यह है कि सभी भारतीय भाषाएं जो हैं उनमें राम कथा और 
महाभारत इन दोनों के अनेक संस्करण हिंदी सभी भाषाओं में नाम मैं किसका लू सभी भाषाओं में मिलते हैं और खास तौर से राम कथा तो कंबन से लेकर के और फिर माधव कंदली असमिया और कृतिवास बंगला और रामचरित मानस हिंदी ये सभी भाषाओं में उसको आप एक खास बात यह है कि ये जो अनुवाद हुए हैं यानी जिसको हम भावानुवाद छाया अनुवाद रिटेलिंग जिसको कहते हैं जो अपने ढंग से मौलिक भी हैं और मूल कथा कहीं से लिया गया भी है ये बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है अपने समय और समाज के अनुसार उनको रिक्रिएट करना अब देखिए तुलसीदास के रामचरित मानस में शंबूक की कथा नहीं है और सीता वनवास की कथा नहीं है आजकल बहुत से लड़के कभी कभी सवाल पूछते हैं कि सीता वनवास या शंभू को ये दोनों कथाएं रामचरित मानस में है ही नहीं जिसका आरोप तुलसी पर लगा दिया जाता है इसी तरह से कृतिवास में निराला ने जो अपनी राम की शक्ति पूजा कविता लिखी वो कृतिवास से लिया तो अलग 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 जो इसके वर्षन दिखाई पड़ते हैं उनको आप अनुवाद भी कह सकते हैं पुनर्कथन भी कह सकते हैं मौलिक भी कह सकते हैं अनुवाद इस अर्थ में कि रामचरित मानस से आपको मैं कुछ पंक्तियां जैसे एकदम अनुवाद जैसे जैसे आता है अहिंसा परमो धर्म तो तुलसीदास लिखते हैं परम धर्म श्रुति विदित अहिंसा मुकं करोति वाचालम पंगुम लंघते गिरिम तो लिखते हैं मूक हो ही वाचाल पंगु चढ़े गिरिवर गहन एकदम अनुवाद आता है कि अष्टादश पुराणे सु व्यास से वचन द्वयम परोपकाराय पुण्याय पापाय पर पीड़नम तुलसी लिखते हैं परहित सरिस धर्म नहीं भाई पर पीड़न सम नहीं अधमाई ठीक ट्रांसलेशन करते चलते अनुवाद भी गीता में आता है कि यदा यदा ही धर्म से ग्लानिर्भवती भारत अभ्युत्थानम धर्म से तदात्मानम सृजाम्य हम तुलसी लिखते हैं जब जब हो ही धर्म की हानि बाढ़ असुर महा अभिमानी अब वो ठीक ट्रांसलेट करते चलते हैं तो इस तरह से ये ट्रांसलेशन भी है रिक्रिएशन भी है मौलिक भी है बहुत कुछ छोड़ दिया गया है इसमें अपना समय अपना समाज बहुत महत्वपूर्ण होता है इसलिए इसका अध्ययन बड़ा इंटरेस्टिंग है मैं कुछ कहना चाहता था कुछ और लेकिन अब समय के कारण मैं कह नहीं पा रहा हूं कभी फिर बाद में यूरोप में जब ट्रांसलेशन शब्द आया उसके अनेक अनेक शताब्दियों पूर्व भारत में अनुवाद की समृद्ध परंपरा आपको मिलती है और उस समय अनुवाद शब्द का यह अर्थ नहीं था जो ट्रांसलेशन का है उल्था तर्जुमा भाषांतर रूपांतर ये उसका अर्थ नहीं था उसका अर्थ यही था रिटेलिंग रिविजन री स्टेटमेंट रिपीटिशन यानी इसी अर्थ में उसका प्रयोग चलता था इसलिए आप देखेंगे कि पुनर्कथन के रूप में और अनुवाद के रूप में कई शब्द संस्कृत में हैं जिनके बारे में हमने यहां कुछ मैटर लिखा भी है जैसे टीका भाष वृत्ति वार्तिक कारिका टिप्पणी और आपको अचरज होगा इतना विशाल साहित्य है भाष्य के रूप में टीका के रूप में वार्तिक के रूप में कारिका के रूप में पूरे संस्कृत लिटरेचर में टीका कहते हैं किसी पद या ग्रंथ का अर्थ स्पष्ट करने वाला वाक्य या ग्रंथ अब जैसे कालिदास के के ग्रंथों की रघुवंश की मेघदूत की कुमार संभव की मल्लिनाथ ने टीकाएं लिखी और मल्लिनाथ की टीकाएं इतनी मशहूर हैं इसी तरह से आप देखेंगे कि न्याय वार्तिक पर वाचस्पत मिश्र की टीका 
शंकर कृत वेदांत भाष्य पर भांति टीका भट्टो जी दीक्षित की सिद्धांत कौमदी पर ज्ञानेन्द्र की तत्वबोधनी टीका मम्मट के काव्य प्रकाश पर बहुत सी टीकाएं लिखी गई और हिंदी में भी आप देखिए जैसे चौरासी और 200 सौ वैष्णव वार्ता पर गुसाई हरिराय की भाव प्रकाश टीका भक्तमाल पर प्रियादास की टीका पद्य में तो बिहारी सत्सई तथा रामचरित मानस पर बहुत सी टीकाएं इस तरह से टीका साहित्य आपको संस्कृत में और हिंदी में और और भी भाषाओं में मिलता है भाष्य हम लोग जानते हैं पतंजलि का महाभाष्य वो पाणिन की का महा का भाष्य है और इस तरह से अनेक भाष शंकराचार्य का ब्रह्मसूत्र भाष्य ये सब ऐसी पुस्तकें हैं जो सारी दुनिया में जानी जाती है पतंजलि का महाभाष्य और ब्रह्मसूत्र भाष्य इस तरह से भाष्य लिखे गए वृत्तियां लिखी गई जैसे अष्टाध्यायी पर पाणिन की जयादित्य और वामन द्वारा रचित काशिका वृत्ति यास के निरुक्त पर दुर्गाचार्य द्वारा रचित वृत्ति इसी तरह से वार्तिक लिखे गए अब इन वार्तिकों में अष्टाध्यायी पर कात्यायन द्वारा लिखे गए वार्तिक कुमारे के श्लोक वार्तिक तथा तंत्र वार्तिक शंकराचार्य कृत बृहदारण्य कोपनिषद भाष्य पर सुरेश्वराचार्य का वार्तिक धर्मकीर्ति का प्रमाण वार्तिक बहुत मशहूर है मगर वो मौलिक ग्रंथ है जिसका उद्धार राहुल सांकृत्यायन ने किया था दो बार उसके उद्धार के लिए वो तिब्बत गए थे एक बार आधी प्रति मिली दूसरी बार दूसरी ये धर्मकीर्ति जो थो नालंदा में प्रोफेसर थे उस समय प्रोफेसर सब नहीं था लेकिन आचार्य थे इसी तरह से कारिकाएं लिखी गई नागार्जुन के सुनिवाद का प्रतिपादन करने वाली माध्यमिक कारिकाएं तो मैं ये सामग्री इसको बहुत विस्तार नहीं देना चाहता मैंने पहले ही कहा सामग्री है आ, सिर्फ इतना कि संस्कृत में भाष्य वार्तिक टीका वृत्ति कारिका इन शब्दों केवल ये शब्द नहीं है सैकड़ों सैकड़ों ग्रंथ इनके मिलते हैं जिनमें मूल ग्रंथों के सूत्र ग्रंथों के विवेचन किए गए हैं व्याख्याएं की गई हैं उनके अनुवाद किए गए हैं सामने रख करके और बड़ा विशाल साहित्य है ये ट्रांसलेशन शब्द यूरोप में आने के कई सौ वर्ष पहले की बात है शताब्दियों शताब्दियों की बात है और जो आगे हम लोग जिसका विवेचन करते हैं कि भारतीय भाषाओं में जिस तरह से वाल्मी खास तौर से वाल्मीकि और व्यास के महाभारत की जो आ, जो जो रीटेलिंग हुई है वो अपने समय को किस तरह से व्यक्त करती है बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर हमारे रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर सुमन सतपति जी टू डिलीवर की नोट एड्रेस respected chair and president of the sahitya academy vishwanath patel prasad ji uh, respected secretary dr k s nivas ji kambar ji and sitan ji um i'm beyond done to you uh, dr rao for having invited me to this seminar and uh, you asked me to deliver the keynote address but uh, after what sitan ji said i think i'll only be uh, a shadow and that to mid day shadow the main tree of your talk uh, you have delivered the real keynote address so mine is just a footnote maybe to what you have said and uh, vishwanath prasad ji whatever you have said uh, both these scholars are eminent scholars they are rooted in our culture so the knowledge of the subject is so deep that i feel uh, uh, you know a sense of trepidation speaking in their presence anyway i have been assigned this task dear friends and i'll have to um speak on the subject 
The title of my paper is A Woman True and Fair, Translation as Retelling. This comes by way of a double allusion. One, of course, is to Dunn's well-known poem, even while it alludes to Yevgeny Yevtushenko's well-known take on translation. Dunn asserted that no woman could be both true and fair. And the Russian poet had equally famously said, and this is an English translation, translation is like a woman. If it is beautiful, it is not faithful. If it is faithful, it is most certainly not beautiful. These are well-known <laughs> statements. Some might disagree and argue that translation can be both beautiful and faithful. Some others might cite numerous examples of translations being both unfaithful and unreadable, some of which we have cited. Some might disagree and argue that translation can be both beautiful, etc. My own position here is that translations need to be beautiful and that most, if not all, beautiful translations are detailed. This is in keeping with the traditional practice and understanding of translation in our, in our part of the world before we imbibe modern ideas of translation, some of which has been talked about. As Harish Trivedi said in a lighter way in an offhand remark during a personal conversation just the other day with me during our meeting, uh, I'm quoting Harish Trivedi's offhand remark, this is not been recorded. No self-respecting Indian in those days believed in faithful translation, unquote. Take the example of the numerous translations of the Ramayana and Mahabharata. This has also been talked about. One of the early instances of such a practice was the Odia Mahabharata, composed by Saradas, circa 1450. In what follows, I shall present and discuss a few samples of translation as retelling, beginning with Saradas from the medieval period and one each from the late colonial and post-independence period. Saradas's retold version carried about 1,40,000 slokas, whereas Sanskrit Mahabharata contains about 1 lakh. The first verses of Mangalacharana or the invocation leave the reader in no doubt concerning the ambivalence of the author and the text, even while defending the enterprise by taking recourse to claims of divine intervention and inspiration. The author translator Saradas assumes a name and a title. Saraladas, his original name is different. Dasa is servant of the local deity Sarala, Ma Sarala, and Sudramani, respectively. He constructs a role for himself which is somewhat ambiguous and makes the modern day reader wonder is he the author or the translator? The poet calls his work the Mahabharata without any warning that he is retelling the epic in Odia. He destabilizes the text by simultaneously creating the illusion of sameness and difference. First of all, he insists and convinces us that he is writing the Mahabharata. He does this by following some textual strategies. Uh, let me summarize what I am saying here in this part. What I am saying here is that Sarala Das is a self-conscious, self-reflexive writer. He is, however, very inconsistent. Sometimes he says that he is retelling the Mahabharata. Sometimes he claims to be the original author. Sometimes he says that all this is being uh, dictated to him by the local deity, Sarala. So whenever, whatever is convenient to him, you know, he, he assumes that role. Uh, you know, when he feels that he is saying something profound, he claims authorship. Whenever he is a bit doubtful whether he is following the original Sanskrit Mahabharata, then he says, I am an ignoramus. I do not know whatever Goddess Sarala is telling me, I am doing it. So he is a very clever, but at the same time, self-conscious author. He understands his predicament. Um, he, he uh, you know, there are a, a couple of interesting things. The journey of its independent identity begins with the Odia inscription juxtaposed with the Sanskrit invocation and is closely followed by the invocation to Ganesha and then the local goddess Sarala. The addressee of the second invocation is more directly invoked, Ganesha, and here he is Vignaraj. Sarala Das clearly distinguishes between Grantha and Kavita, credits Vyasa for having wrought this transformation with permission from Vishwabhasa the all-pervasive. Words such as writing and poetry are self-reflexively used 
and he says the ancient treatise you disseminated crediting lord ganesha who supposedly acted as the scribe now this mahabharata of by sarala das was the only mahabharata that odias read for nearly 400 years no con- uh, unless they were pandits brahmi pandit brahmins they would not read the original sanskrit this is the the mahabharata for them and this continued to be the most popular mahabharata for nearly 400 years no one question why there was no gita in this mahabharata like many of the omissions you mentioned um i do not know the shastras sarala das would say once in a while i am an ignoramus but at places he justifies how he has composed in accordance with the shastras i have thus recounted sri madhya parva in accordance with the shastras for the good of the world o oh, men in spite of the deviations it continued to be popular uh, till the mid 19th century when print culture arrived with the introduction of european notions of translation things began to change in october 1867 a pre publication notice in a periodical of a more recent translation of the epic calls the new version authentic it says you know saladas mahabharata is no mahabharata this one is the uh, this is by maharaja krishna singh this is a literal translation and you must trust this forget about sarala mahabharata in any case that is dandipoti and it is a, it is not available in print so you know it will be very expensive to buy the palm leaf manuscripts of uh, you know very written sarala das the announcement highlights the advantages of the text over sarala das's bhasha version it says the bhasha bharata see sarala das's mahabharata was called the bhasha bharata Uh, which is in circulation now is unable to garner the approval of the wise for its many dissimilarities with the sanskrit mahabharata these are quotations from the odia periodical uh, which are translated into english krishna singh's version is appreciated by the wise as it is a close translation of the original and sarala das's version is run down so this is how fortunes begin to change in the case of sarala mahabharata and uh, you know the main reason being that it is not true to the original sanskrit mahabharata uh the second mahabharata which was translated by fakir mohan sanapati nana dadan fakir mohan sanapati when his wife was not well he uh, he offered a very simplified in or simply simple odia the mahabharata many parvas of the mahabharata he had translated and that was also printed and it was advertised like the other mahabharata and uh, it says again there is an advertisement it says the mahabharata composed by saradas is widely circulated in utkala desha however to call it a separate pustak would not be an overstatement so it is not the mahabharata it is a separate pustak and this is what uh, comes up by way of an advertisement for fakir mohan's translation but these are clearly early indications of the way in which traditional perception of translational practices we are shifting towards the modern notion of faithful translation of an original text but old habits die hard and fakir mohan himself followed this harala das model when he wrote patent medicine patent medicine is a very well known very popular odia short story one of his best known which is my next example patent medicine is the story of a late 19th century odia libertine chandramani who cheats on his wife sulochana with the help of his servant makara chandramani is able to frequent the house of usmantara a tawai like figure sulochana lays a trap and is able to catch her husband red handed and thrashes him mercilessly with a broomstick until chandramani vows never again to drink and indulge in debauchery since broom thrashing cured chandramani of this malady the narrator calls the title of therapy patent medicine in english this is the only story or work by fakir mohan which carries an english title patent medicine this story was thought to be an original piece of work by fakir mohan until 18 at until 1961 for nearly uh, 55 years it was thought to be fakir mohan's original story even now 
when the Bengali critic Sudhakar Chattopadhyay told the world through his study Satyendranath, the motor translator, that it is derived from the Japanese play Zazen via two translations. First, Zazen, the play, Japanese play, was translated into English and it was called um, Abstraction. And it appeared in an anthology called The Classical Poetry of the Japanese, edited by Chamberlain, which in turn was translated into Bangla by Satyendranath as Nidhya Desana. Nidhi, Nidhi Dhyasana. In his chapter, The Imitation of Satyendranath in Odia Literature, Sudhakar Chattopadhyay is in Bangla. This, this study is in Bangla. Sudhakar Chattopadhyay conjectures that it must have been in either Bharati or Rangamali, these two periodicals in Bengal, that Fakirman found the model for his patent medicine. Regrettably, however, Chattopadhyay says, the Odia author never admitted that his story was only an imitation of Satyendranath's great play. So he discounts Fakirman having come across the English translation or even the Japanese original, he must have come across only the Bengali play, Nididhyasana. Today, so, uh, he complains, the translator playwright Satyendranath has been forgotten and so he calls his books uh, 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 Amor Anubadok Satyendranath. And so even now if you see a Wikipedia entry, he is not mentioned as a translator. But this particular uh, study highlights his contribution as a translator and how his translations have influenced other works in the other regional languages. Fakirmon has written a brilliant story and I have not the slightest doubt about its literary value. It bears the stamp of a mature hand. But the one thing that I have to say is this, the story is not original. It is only Satyendranath's play in Odia in story form. This is, uh, there is an interesting aspect. I am not saying here that Fakirmon did it deliberately. This was a widespread practice. I have seen many periodicals in Odia like Utkal Sahitya and many others where uh, translations, verbatim translations of uh, romantic poet, po a lot of romantic poems, Victorian poems appear under the name of these Odia authors. They are never called translations because people were not aware of the copyright issues or questions of plagiarism. So when Fakirmon did it, you know, it was, he, he did so, you know, well within his rights or rather contemporary practices. The other, when I read the Japanese play in English translation, I found that it was, I mean, Fakirmon's story, in spite of the fact that he indigenizes it, completely locates in it in the Odia context, it is still, there are many dialogues between the husband and the wife, the husband and the servant, which are replicated in Odia. So even though these translations have traveled Japanese, English, Bangla and then Odia, you can still see the connection between the Odia and the Japanese. So this is what struck me as astounding and this is certainly what Saraladas was doing. It's not very different. But then um, Odias did not know about it until the year uh, 1967 when the great Odia critic Nottavar Samantrai comes across this study and he tells the Odias, look here, patent medicine is patently a borrowing or a translation, but Fakirman has done it in, with such brilliance that it surpasses. Just as Satyendranath's story is said to be much superior to the English translation, the Odia translation is also claimed to be much superior to both the Bengali and the English and the Japanese. So this is, uh, thus the fact that neither Satyendranath's Nididhyasana nor Fakirman's patent medicine is an original work does not deter the critics from celebrating both for their original brilliance, quote unquote. After these two examples drawn from the local texts of Odisha, my third instance of translation as retelling is a global text. Six years back, I was invited to coordinate the Indian chapter of a global project on Alice in a, Wonder, or Alice in a World of Wonderlands, the translations of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. 
The director of the project was John Linset, and the project was itself a part of at least 150 under the aegis of the Louis Carroll Society of North America. So Alice in Wonderland was celebrating 150 years of its life. And many claim that it is the most uh, fourth or third most translated text in the world. Uh, you know, uh, but one could never ascertain. You know, though clearly uh, 164 languages it has been translated into. 164 languages and many other dialects. Scholars were identified to study translations of Alice in scores of languages and dialects the world over and write about them. For one thing, Carol himself had testified to the nature of the challenge to the translators even before the first translation had been attempted. Lewis Carroll had said when he went to Oxford, friends here, he said, I'm quoting Lewis Carroll, seem to think that the book is untranslatable into either French or German. Imagine these are also European languages. The puns and songs being the chief obstacles because it's nonsense. This, of course, proved equally daunting for the Indian translators, but the differences between the European and the subcontinental cultures made the task even more onerous for our translators. Our brief now, what we were asked to do, you know, was to exactly back translate the translations. Say, Odia, Bangla, Gujarati, Marathi, all these Alice's were to be back translated accurately. So the difference between the other translation, the original translation and our translation was this, that whereas the original translator could play loose and fast with Alice in Wonderland, we as back translators had to be very, very faithful to this. So no matter, we were not expected to write a beautiful back translation. It had to, so that the world knew what were the cultural shifts which had been made when Alice is being relocated in Odisha or Bengal or whatever. Um, during the centenary celebrations of Alice in Wonderland, that is 1964-65, Weaver had selected these eight pages as they test the ability of the translator to handle a number of difficult parts of Carol's nonsense this is about half the chapter entitled A Mad Tea Party. Most of us would recall the chapter A Mad Tea Party. It is the most challenging chapter. And half of that chapter was to be back translated by us, different tra translators. It begins with Twinkle Twinkle Little Bat, where Carol is actually parodying Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. He, he, uh, he says, Twinkle Twinkle Little Bat is where it starts from try, and then it ends trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. The purpose of doing this was to be able to read in English how the translator into the foreign languages dealt with Carolian nonsense and wordplay. It was an amazing experience for us going through the translations. It was evident that many of the excellent translations had to make uh, radical departures from the original and created their own unique brand of nonsense and strangeness in their respective linguistic cultures. Let us see how. I'll give you a couple of <coughs> instances. For the sake of familiarity, I shall sample a few Indian translations. The challenge for each translator and back translator began with Mad Hatta saying, Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you are at. You know the song, perhaps. I have heard something like that, <coughs> said Alice. It goes on, you know, the hatter continued in this way. Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky, twinkle, twinkle, then he goes to sleep. There are two translations of Alice in Wonderland into Urdu. Saida Zubairi was the first calling his translation Alice Ajnabi Dunya Mein. It was published in Lahore. The second and more famous translation is by Muhammad Khalid Akhtar, which was published in 1981 as Ali Ka Nagar by Hijra Publication Islamabad. For some reason, both these translations, these are the only translations in Urdu and they were by uh, Pakistanis and they were published in Pakistan. So what does it do with the parody? It's not a translation of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. 
but it, it had to be a translation of the parody of Twinkle Twinkle Little Bat. He says, Chamak, uh, Chamak, Chamak, Chamak for Twinkle Twinkle. Tum asman ki taraf na dekho, ye shikre chile aur parinde, yun hi udte rahenge sare, tum asman ki taraf na dekho, udo chilo, udo parindo, udo charindo, udo darindo. So all kinds of nonsense words he uses. The dormos then squeaks in his sleeves, charindo, parindo, darindo, farindo, or Gando, Gando is, you know, stink. Instead of twinkle, twinkle. Though the first known translation of Alice in Hindi is by Kishore Garg in 1956, the oldest popular translation is Sikant Vyasa's Magic World, first published in 1958. This is English. Uh, sorry, Hindi translation. It omits the parodied verses because the parodied verses were very difficult to translate. And even the nonsense lines, the dialogues, were equally daunting. So there are many translations of Alice in Wonderland which completely drop uh, at least half of this chapter. Three years after Vyasa's translation, the well-known Hindi writer Shamsher Bahadur Singh is highly respected, so nonsense is not uh, beneath anyone's dignity. Uh, he published a more elaborate but not always close translation of Alice entitled Ashir Lokme Alice. He tries to offer the Hindi version of the parody thus. Tim 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 chanko chanko nanhe nanhe chankadar dek chakit hu dek chakit hu etc etc. The fat rat in his sleepy throaty sound started repeatedly slowly tim 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 tim. So how do we as back translators translate this? This was you know, equally challenged and we did not have the freedom, you know, all the profound talk of, you know, doing a creative translation was not our brief. We had to exactly back translate them so that the Anglophone reader will see the cultural adjustments that the translator has made. A new translation appeared in 1990, this time by another well-known Hindi writer, Krishna Valdev Vaid. And he was infamous for breaking every rule in Hindi. A more recent translation of Alice was published as Alice Ascharya ke lok mein, Ascher lok mein. Curiously, the translator is relatively young, Charu Chandra Pathak. He told us telephonically that the publisher specifically asked him to use a modern colloquial idiom since the older translations were too literary and thus not fit for children. This deliberate modernization of the Hindi idiom can be seen in the title of the Mad Tea Party chapter, which Pathak translates as Ek Bakwas Chai Party. It doesn't call it uh, Pagalon Ka Chai. He says a Bakwas Chai Party. And in the use of certain other colloquial expressions such as Sutakkar, you know, somebody who is addicted to sleeping, Sutakkar which can be loosely translated as a compulsive sleeper or one addicted to sleep. So we can see how uh, translators are constantly being very innovative in their translation of nonsense. We could sense that the translators had a tough time not only grappling with the nonsense but also finding local equivalent for certain animals and items of food or drink. I will skip many of these but there is one interesting uh, point where Alice is offered wine. Now how can a young, a small girl like Alice, 11 or 12 years, be offered wine? So isko bhi change karne lage, wine ko. Sarbat, koi sarbat kar diya usko. For example, the March here offers Alice some wine. In the Indian ethos, wine has been synonymous with any alcoholic beverage and therefore not just a taboo for children, but was for a long time virtually unmentionable in children's literature. The Urdu translator Akhtar replaced wine with Angur ka Sarvat Varvat. Angur ka Sarvat Varvat. The common substitute is grape juice, sirap or Sarvat. Pathak, the more recent translation, translator says Angur ki Sarab. Angur ki Sarab. Not any Sarab. Angur ki Sarab is acceptable perhaps. A milder alcoholic product fermented from grapes. You know, he explains it also in a, within the text. That is not problem ni hai isme. Alice ko offer karna. That is considered less. The common perception is that drinking any kind of wine should be prohibited. 
when ved faced the same problem in his hindi translation he chose to stick to the original and <coughs> uh, called it um, sharab simply sharab offered kiya gaya you know he he didn't have any qualms about as is being offered sharab um but in all these cultural translations a bengali version takes the kick wine ko kya kehte hain the march hair offering alis pious pious <laughs> wine becomes pious <laughs> and i think in your language it is phuluri is there something called phuluri phuluri in gujarati or marathi फ्रॉम मूंग का कुछ बनाते हैं ना हाँ तो फ्लोरी हाँ 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 फ्लोरी सो वाइन बिकम फ्लोरी इन अदर लैंग्वेजेस वेर इज द ओरिजिनल ट्रांसलेटर गेव हिमसेल्फ और हर सेल्फ द लिबर्टी ऑफ प्लेइंग फास्ट एंड लूज विद इंग्लिश ओरिजिनल वीक बैक ट्रांसलेटर्स वे आर लेस फॉर्चुनेट वी हैव टू स्टिक टू द ओरिजिनल ट्रांसलेटर the purpose of discussing at some length three examples of i'll take just 5 7 minutes more the purpose of discussing at some length three examples of popular translations as retelling is to rethink the wisdom of translation theory agonizing over question of faithful translation we have not even spared the translations by the authors themselves of their own work when tego translated gitanjali we can we have not been able to excuse him for having translated him this gitanjali we we claim that his bengali can be better translated by us um and uh, we have gone to the extent of kamale harish trivedi asking which premchand urdu or hindi when we are translating premchand stories or novels which one are we going to translate because he has himself translated from urdu to hindi or vice versa now there are solutions to this question like let us read both and then try to translate both one story two versions both by the author so we have gone to that extent now i will come to a specific controversy minor controversy involving manoj das manoj das um translates his own works into english and calls himself a bilingual writer even while doing so in an interview in 2009 given to journal of literature and aesthetics from kerala he said and i quote him below verbatim and at some length this is very important yes i would like to translate my own stories i am not a translator i am a writer in both the languages odia and english when i am writing in another language from one language of my story to another language of the same story i have the freedom which i alone can enjoy if mr x is translating my story he has to be faithful as possible as faithful as possible to the original when i am recreating my own story i am translating i am i am not translating i am only presenting the same inspiration in another garb manoj das says i have the freedom to change it here and there to improve upon it or to alter something which the translator cannot so so he is denying the freedom to the translator to be creative that is why i like translating my own work now one of the greatest translators of india uh, and certainly of odisha vikram das who in a way made poroja by gopinath mahanti famous through his translation uh, takes his shoes with this position of manoj das and um, anyway translation theorists like trivedi find fault with premchand's use of high hindi in hindi versions and sanskritized words and phrases in their urdu versions what is the validity then of the position that both versions by premchand need to be looked into in a spirited attack on the position held by manoj das cited above <coughs> vikram das argos and i quote vikram das translation is essentially an interpretive activity and interpretation will always be subjective something that both of you have said this is a position that vikram das arrives at after much logical argument but ultimately this is a return to the traditional notions of translation 
where instead of the invisibility of the translator, the author is rendered invis invis invisible. See, we, we don't remember Vyasa when we read Sarla Das. We call it Sarla Das himself. And in fact, Fakirmon is called Vyasa Kavi because he translated the Mahabharata into Odia. So, uh, we take it, we, we speak about the invisibility of the translator, we complain about the invisibility of the translator, but our traditional notions of translation is such that the author becomes invisible in a way. Like the Japanese original. Who, who knows Jap the Japanese original? We all know Fakirman's patent medicine and so on and so forth. The author is rendered invisible as we are the authors of the Sanskrit Mahabharata, the Japanese Zazen and Alice in Wonderland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sumanya Satpati, for uh, your very thought-provoking keynote address. And also the uh, practitioners of uh, this translation in India, how they are acting on the translation. And this is what Sahit Academy is also facing. That is why sometimes we get the criticism uh, about the Sahit Academy's publication, particularly in Hindi and English. Uh, but it is, uh, as you proved it, it is ongoing for the last 200 years or so from the Fakir Monsena Pati's times it is happening. So one should accept also what we are doing right now. And now uh, I request Vice President Sahit Academy, Professor Chandrasekhar Kambarji, to say a few words and also propose the word of thanks. I thank my president, Sri Vishnath Prasad Tiwariji, for chairing this session. And I also thank Chitamsu Yashis Chandra for his excellent paper. And also Sumanyu Satpatiji for his interesting paper. And also Dr. Rao and you in particular for giving patient hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, now we don't have any break, uh, but uh, still there is a outside um, uh, uh, a tea is there that we have kept since morning to evening. So whenever you want to have a tea, one by one, please go and have a tea. But uh, some people, I request them to be here because we need an audience also. Uh, now the next session is going to be chaired by Mini Krishna. And she is joining very soon now. And uh, we have a the proper presentation, Chandrakant Patil, Nandakishwar Pandey, Jail Reddy. So, uh, if you want to have a tea, and uh, uh, kindly come back in uh, one or two minutes. <laughs>